Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your hot takes, your observations, your questions, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. Over 24 hours ago, I posted on the YouTube community tab. Many of you commented. It's a good comment section. This is the post-Australian Open mailbag officially. After this, I will be taking a little bit of a break, which is much needed. So thank you for everybody who commented, and thank you for everybody who is watching. Let's get going. This first comment, just something that was in the news, and I, I thought I should talk about it off the top. It is from Boki. Hey, Gil, could you cover the news surrounding Djokovic's hamstring injury? Apparently a 3-centimeter or 1.2-inch tear. First of all, I thought it was weird that Craig Tiley was the one to put this out there. Like, shouldn't he have let Novak control the narrative in this respect? Like when Djokovic told, or someone in Djokovic's team told Craig Tiley the results of his imaging, his MRI, like did they expect that Craig was just going to tell the media? So that seems pretty weird. At the same time, it's pretty much besides the point, and I'm not like offended by it. I just think it's strange that Craig would do that. Uh, the second part is that, I don't know, uh, nothing changes. Nothing changes from this news. But also there, there are four muscles in the hamstring. And uh, I think, I, I don't know much about the specifics of this, but I'm sure based on which one you tear and where you tear it, that also has an effect on your ability to function. So Tylee saying, oh, it was a three centimeter tear. It doesn't actually tell us as much as it might sound like it tells us. But also it doesn't matter. Who cares? It's all the same. Uh, ultimately, all Craig Tiley did was continue this somewhat annoying news cycle that exposed a lot of biases and fractures and, and flaws in uh, tennis injury discourse. And I made a video about it and everything, almost 90% of what I said on that video I stand by. I will use this time to say... There's 10% of that video that I do regret, which was the end. Uh, and I, I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson. I made a mistake. And that is, I should never really feel like I have a good idea of what everyone in the media is saying about anything, ever. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just, I, I made some claims about how the situation was being covered and... The reality is there was a lot that I didn't read and didn't see and didn't hear. You know, I, I consumed some ESPN. I consumed some world feed. I followed the journalists who I follow and I didn't see it, but there was stuff out there that I, I just could not account for. From Josh Ford. Hey Gil, I have two questions if you have time, which are somewhat related. Where do the original next gen stand now? Tsitsipas seems quite secure and on the way up, even if he isn't the new fetter some might have hoped. Medvedev, Zverev, and Rublev all seem to be at critical junctures in their career. Rublev needing to step up, Medvedev needing to regain his level, and Zverev returning from serious injury. Could we already have seen the best of this generation? Secondly, who would you have, have as the fourth best player in the world on form and ability after Djokovic, Alcaraz, and Tsitsipas? The field seems pretty thin after that, and it's hard to truly pick someone for me. So I guess your first question is, could we have seen the best of this generation besides Tsitsipas? Well, I kind of disagree with you about Rublev. I don't see how this is a critical juncture because Rublev has been pretty much the same for three years in a row now. And if you don't believe me, or if you're offended by that statement, just look at his ranking. It's the same ranking now for three maybe even more than three years now, Rublev is just the same in the rankings. And I think he's been pretty much the same player. So I don't see any critical juncture here. I just think Rublev, unless there are some unforeseen changes in his future, which can happen, I'm not saying Rublev can never get better, but I'm saying I'm not seeing any reason to think like, oh, wow, like this is a very interesting next couple, six months or next couple, uh, I don't see this as a critical juncture for Rublev. Zverev, yeah. Yeah, how's it going to be coming back? Like, is he going to get back to where he was? Sure. Medvedev? Sure. 
Although Medvedev, I, I do think we've seen the best from, from Medvedev. Which is number one. Number one in the world. That's that's the best that we've seen from Medvedev. Where it was him and Novak at the top. Do I think that will happen again? Not really, no. Pass, yeah. On the way up. Uh, yeah. It feels that way now, but it's also just one tournament. And it's a tournament that historically he's done great at. And he's been worse generally in the second half of the year. And he's had, I think, some burnout issues. So that's something to track. The second part of this is who would you have as the fourth best player in the world? And you acknowledge that it's pretty hard to pick someone. That's because there's no good answer to that question right now. There's simply not. I think there's a tier one. And this is why I do tiers, by the way. This is the very reason, because there's no good answer to who's the fourth best player in the world right now. That's why I do tiers. In tier one, it's Djokovic and Alcaraz. You could say maybe Djokovic belongs in a tier by himself. I just think let's let Alcaraz play tennis before we do that, right? We got to let him play. He hasn't played. So Djokovic and Alcaraz in tier one. Tsitsipas is in tier two. And... uh you know, I think he's alone in Tier 2. Now, there was a period of time where I thought it was Medvedev and Tsitsipas occupying a tier by themselves, or Medvedev, Tsitsipas, Zverev, pre-injury, occupying a tier by themselves. Zverev isn't there anymore. Medvedev isn't there right now. Suddenly, Tsitsipas, there's nobody in the tier. Nadal, let me just tell you right now, I don't know where to put Nadal. I'm not including Nadal in this. <laughs> I just don't know. I just don't know. He, he His level has not been a top 10 level in over eight months right now. So what am I supposed to do with Nadal? He's in a holding period for me. It's a question mark. He, he doesn't go in any tier. So tier two, Tsitsipas, all by himself. Tier one, Djokovic, Alcaraz. Tier three, lots of people. Big, 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 big traffic jam. And most of these players did not do well in Melbourne. So, you know, tier three, I think you got to put Rude there. I think you got to put Felix there. I think you got to put Runa there. I think you got to put Medvedev there. I think you got to put Sinner there. Next tier, Fritz, Rublev, Nori. All right, I'm not going to keep going, but I'm going to stop there. But I think you kind of get the idea. I think I answered the question as best I can. There's no fourth best player right now. There's a, there's a large group that that are really occupying that same level. From Sean. Gil, speculate on how many AOs you think Novak retires with. I'm just going to stop the question right there. It's all about motivation. That's all I'll say. You've heard me say this before. I don't like predicting longevity. And the reason I don't like predicting longevity is because I don't know how healthy a player is going to be able to stay. And I don't know how motivated they are going to remain. For Novak, the health thing appears really, really positive right now. Even though he just had to work through an injury to win the Australian Open. Uh, it, it seems really positive right now in the, in the sense that he is... Uh, maintaining and preserving his athletic prowess. Doing a really good job of that, right? But all I say, and I, I've said the same thing about Nadal and Federer. I mean, if we get to a point where Novak Djokovic distances himself from Rafa Nadal and Roger Federer and pulls away as the most accomplished tennis player of all time, How is he going to keep the fire burning? Is he really going to be able to run up the score at 39 years old? Is that going to happen? I, I don't... Maybe. All I say to this question is consider motivation. Uh, you, you talk about a lot of things here. You talk about height of bounce. You talk about uh, the, the break before the Australian Open. 
You talk about, you know, maybe his rivals. Forget that stuff. If Novak is going to win 14 Australian Opens, that would mean that at 39 years old, he is still highly motivated to make all of the sacrifices required to be a top tennis player in the world. How do we know he's going to want to do that? <laughs> like That's just not a given. So that's my answer to that. Road to Dawn. Do you like the post Aussie swing slash pre sunshine double section of tennis? That's the European indoor hard court, the golden swing and smaller U S hard court tournaments leading into the middle Eastern swing. Or would you like a more consistent lead into Indian Wells and Miami? Mm, you're basically asking, do I like February tennis? In, in, a, in a way I do. First of all, there's a lot of individual tournaments that I like. I, I just want to say I love South America. Like, I think the crowds are probably the best that we see all year long, not, not including like majors. The South American tennis crowds are phenomenal, which makes a big difference to me. So I really like those South American tournaments on the clay. I like Rotterdam. It's a great one. The American ones, meh, not awesome, usually. I like the diversity. If if you're going to have a week where uh, there's a lot of different tournaments going on, isn't it so much more fun to have all of these different events, these different decisions that players can make, and you're seeing different colors, and you're seeing different time zones? Isn't that so much better than... I don't know, a week in October where it's like, well, they're playing indoor hardcore tennis in Sofia and they're playing indoor hardcore tennis in Vienna and they're playing indoor hardcore tennis in Gijón, Spain. Yeah, this is so much better than that. That said, if we're going to shorten the calendar, which I think would be good for most parties... Uh, would February be on the chopping block? If I were to take out like three months of the calendar, would February be axed? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Next one is from Reed. Hey, Gil, I put this in another video, but you may not have seen it. Well, I don't think you put in another mailbag, so I wouldn't have answered it. Here it goes. Wondering if you can spend some time talking about how bad the coverage of the Australian Open is now in the States. With ESPN inexplicably not sending folks over there and the reduced TV windows with no tennis channel to pick up the slack, it was pretty disappointing. I'm concerned with the growth of the sport here in general, right? Right as we look to be producing our best crop of young men's players in at least two decades. ESPN stopped covering the Masters events last year, I believe, and this feels like another step in the direction of less investment. There's a lot there. Let me go point by point for this comment. So the first thing you say is ESPN inexplicably not sending folks over there. Let's address that. Uh, here's the reason. And by the way, I don't support it. I'm against it. Everybody's against it. In fact, I'm sure eh, I won't make assumptions. I won't make assumptions about how the decision makers feel or how the people at ESPN feel. But uh, look, it's not ideal. Nobody would call it ideal. I will explain it though. Essentially, traveling is obviously much more expensive. You have you have crews of I would I would guess for the Australian Open to be put on ESPN has to fly sixty five people conservatively sixty five people go to Australia so you're keeping sixty five people in a hotel you are you know obviously flying you know paying for their travel you're giving them a per diem so that they can eat. Uh, you're setting up infrastructure on the grounds, which is more expensive usually than running a, a remote broadcast out of your facilities, in this case in Bristol, Connecticut. So the costs are massive. The reason it's different from Wimbledon and the U.S. Open is how much money they're able to bring in and how much money they're able to bring in is is not good for the Australian Open because of the time slot. 
on the east coast of the United States, it's about 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. And you're never going to make, you're never going to do good ratings at one in the morning. So the costs are the same for Wimbledon, the U.S. Open. Costs are exactly the same, but the revenue is much, much, much less. Actually, the only difference, the cost, maybe they get to pay the Aussie a little bit less money. So maybe the costs aren't exactly the same. But besides the rights fees, everything is the same. The revenue is less. That's why they don't send people over there. It's not because Australia is far away. It's because it's because they can't make money on it. That's the reason. So I'm, I'm not supporting it. I'm just giving you an explanation for something that you, you classified as inexplicable. Just trying to help here. Uh, reduced TV windows. That is more inexplicable. Are they trying to just drive ESPN Plus subscriptions? Is that what they're trying to do? I, I don't know. That is much harder to explain. For me, doesn't actually bother me as much because like I'm an ESPN Plus subscriber anyway. It's how I watch the New York Rangers play in Los Angeles. So I don't really mind it, but I, man, to maximize eyeballs, you want it on linear television and you want it on ESPN plus. It's not a pick and choose thing. It should be a both thing. That part I don't get. All right. Next part. Uh, concerned about the growth of the sport. Uh, the ESPN stopped covering masters events. Yeah. I, I'm not convinced. Look. I work for Tennis Channel, so I'm, just to reveal my biases here, I'm not convinced that ESPN covering the Masters was actually a a, a help uh, for anybody involved, ESPN or, or tennis, uh, because, I mean, I feel like the era of like, wow, I just, because, you know, they were just covering the end of tournaments. I think the era of like, I just stumbled across... The Miami Open Final, because I was flipping channels, and now I'm going to watch it. I feel like that era is uh, a, a product of the past. I don't think that happens anymore. So in general, I think it's important that there's consistency and that people know where to find the tennis. And in this case, unless it's the Australian Open, Wimbledon, or, or, uh, or the U.S. Open, everybody in the United States knows exactly where to find the tennis. It's on Tennis Channel. Uh, and if it's one of those three majors, then it's on ESPN. Did I answer everything here? You're not wrong to be concerned about the Australian Open coverage and and ESPN uh, getting the rights, like making that investment in in owning the Australian Open, but then not seemingly being committed to maximizing the product. You are right about that. From Noah, Hi, hey Gil, I'm curious to know your thoughts on FAA's projected 2023 season and whether you still viewed him as a lock to eventually win a slam. Did I say he's a lock? I don't know that I said lock. I probably said I think he will win a slam because I, I do think he will win a slam. I would not say he's a lock. I, I don't think I ever said that. Okay, uh, the comment continues. After being touted as the face of the next gen for so long, it seems most have sold their stock on Felix, but the tools have always been there, and I feel like his mental game has improved over time, albeit still a weakness. As one of the few peoples of color at the highest level of the ATP Tour, I imagine that there is a significant level of pressure that many may fail to acknowledge. As for the last part of the comment, I think that's a great question. I wouldn't want to make any assumptions on that in terms of how it affects Felix, but it's a great, it's a great question. I'm sure Felix would be happy to to answer it, but I, I don't know how it affects Felix. I don't know if he, if that's something that he rarely thinks about, or if it's something that, that he does think about and, and he does feel pressure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, mental game has it improved. Yeah. I think that was the biggest thing that was much better last year. You're right. You know, there's still a lot going for him. The firepower, serve forehand firepower plus the athleticism. Great combination. Great combination. But then there are a lot of those those finer parts of the game. Volleys, touch, backhand, 
point construction, consistency of the forehand, all of those little things, return, all those little things can get better. Uh, against Lehechka, it was the same thing, the same thing we, we keep seeing uh, outdoors and on slower surfaces. He lost the rallies. He, he was not winning from neutral. Zero through four, he was fine. That, that big serve, that first forehand, that's good. Can you be an elite baseliner? He just is not doing that yet at, at a, on a regular basis. So that's the thing to watch. And for Felix, you know, last year was a successful season. He had to win titles, and he did. He won four of them. Now it's time to improve the play on slower surfaces and outdoors. This one from Shelly. Analysis of Tommy Paul. The only unseated in the semifinals, and if he had been up against anyone except Nole, would he have made it into the final, in your opinion? Look, I'm not going to speculate on, like, if he would have beaten Tsitsipas. Probably not, quite frankly. Uh, I did want to include this comment, though, because there are a couple of things that Tommy has done that I just want to throw out there because so much has changed for Paul. The one thing that I've covered a lot is the fact that he developed his transition game and became a an aggressive player who takes the ball early and moves forward when he has an opportunity to attack. That I've covered a ton. But a, a, a couple of other things have kind of shifted into place. First of all, physically. He's always been quick. He's always been a great athlete. But he's also worn down a lot physically in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, he hasn't always been professional about his recovery. Stretching, uh, diet, all of those kinds of things that will will help him be stronger physically. So he's done better in that area. And he has hired a physio who has not only helped him with, with the recovery, but also he's had this, this elbow issue for a really long time that's really hurt him on the surf. And that's why he's worn that right arm sleeve for so long. The physio really fixed the elbow issue. So now he's not feeling any pain. Plus, he made a racket change. He's using that that red Yonex now instead of the Wilson Blade 98. So much has, has changed. And when a player makes a breakthrough run and you can identify all of these things that uh, that player is doing differently. Oh, there's one more that I didn't mention. He's much more uh, deliberate now uh, in his mental game during matches. You can see him playing much more slow, going to the towel more, Focusing a lot more on his breathing, not letting his mind drift during changeovers, and he's much more focused, much more locked in. Uh, and a lot of these things uh, are, are things that he's talked about that I, I will say, just so you guys know, I wouldn't have picked up on all of these things if he didn't say these things. But like I watched him in Davis Cup, and, and there was a time where, where he went down for love. Davis Cup, this is after the Australian Open, okay? He, he just played yesterday, and I called the match. Uh, he did lose his focus in this match, but there were times where things were going wrong for him. He would play one point, make a bad mistake. He wasn't tired. They're playing indoors, and he would go towel off to get his mind right. I know he would. He was not toweling off because he was sweating. He was not toweling off because he was tired. He was toweling off because he was trying to refocus himself. So these, all these new little wrinkles into his game. So many new things. When a player has a breakthrough and they've changed a million things at the same time, that's where you really start to pay attention and you, and you start to think, all right, well, this is probably not a fluke. He made adjustments and the adjustments worked. And that's what we just saw. From Thonkos. Thanks for being a member. Obviously, making year-end predictions and slam winner predictions later into the season is really difficult due to the fact that players can drop in form and rise up so quickly. Sport is unpredictable. So my question is, if you had to reevaluate your year-end top 10 after this Australian Open, which changes would you make and why? All right. Uh, Tsitsipas, I had at number six because I was concerned about his mental game. Well, guess what? As soon as I saw Tsitsipas at United Cup, as soon as I saw Tsitsipas play his first couple matches at the Australian Open, I was like, oh, he's back. You know, the mental is right back there, clicked into place. 
So I would not have him at six anymore. I'd probably have him at three. I'd have him above Nadal. I would have him above Medvedev. And I would have him above uh, Rude. I'd probably have Tsitsipas at three now. Uh, Medvedev, I think I have too high. You know, that quarter loss was disappointing. You know, that there are not really any good explanations or, or ways to spin that match positively for Medvedev. The surface was ideal, right? The conditions were ideal. He wasn't playing someone who is inherently a matchup nightmare, and he lost in straights. There's just, there's just not a lot of good to take out of that. So uh, Medvedev, I would have lower than, uh, I think I have him number four. I think I have him four. I'd have him probably seven or eight at this point. Those are the big ones. Let's move on. From Jason. Uh, what did you make of the Australian Open renewing a contract with Dunlop during the media friendly frenzy about how dead the balls were? I feel like the AO gave a middle finger to the players by not even waiting until the end of the tournament to make a call like this and take more feedback. All right. Uh, uh, here's what I got to say about this. About this one. As far as I know, I mean, I could be wrong. Look, I'm, I haven't been in these negotiations. I'm pretty sure whichever manufacturer ponies up the most money is going to get the rights. Like, I, I re, I'd be utterly shocked if Wilson was like, we'll pay you this much. And Dunlop was like, well, we'll only pay you this much. And Australian Open was like, eh, you know, we just prefer Dunlop. We're going to take a little pay cut and we're just going to go with Dunlop because we like the tennis balls. Nah, it's it's pretty much whoever pays the most. So keep that in mind. Uh, if the Australian Open wants the balls to be adjusted, they probably have the power to make that request. I believe they have that power. And I think Dunlop will uh, would be happy to oblige. So... Uh, I wouldn't read too much into it, to be honest. I think it just means that Dunlop was willing to pay the most money. From PK Blinders, do you think that effectively redirecting the ball is becoming a little bit of a lost art on the tour? It's one thing that really stands out when you watch Joker now against the field. Even Nadal seems to loathe to go down the line unless it's on clay where he has time to set up the shot. Very interesting. Very, very interesting comment. I would say for the most part, calling redirecting a lost art is probably too extreme just because it's such a basic part of the game. Like redirecting is never going to, it's never going to be like serve and volley where it could be like, Hey, nobody's redirecting anymore. Right. If you know what I mean? So I'd, I'd say calling it a lost art is too extreme, but for you to, to kind of point out that it's not as prevalent, I think that's pretty sound. Uh, there is an explanation for it though. I mean, it's just because racket technology has put a, a, a larger emphasis on playing from further back in the court and hitting a bigger, heavier ball. So usually players who, who redirect have, you know, technically they keep their technique a little bit shorter. They usually have less extreme grips uh, they take the ball earlier, and it's more about timing the ball perfectly. It's less about getting that violent, you know, big racket speed where they're generating a lot. So usually pace generation and effective redirecting, usually they don't go hand in hand. It's it's one or the other. I mean, so, look, Djokovic strikes an incredible balance between the two of being able to generate, but also redirecting and taking the ball early. And that's because of how sound his technique is and how incredible his timing is and his balance. So uh, if you're comparing everybody to Novak, yeah, yeah, nobody does it like Novak. That's true. And then if you're looking at the larger pattern, I would say, are there, you know, if you watch the tennis in the early 2000s where you have more, you definitely have more like Andre Agassi, Nikolai Davidenko. Uh, who else? 
I don't know. I mean, even like Federer. Federer's game was more predicated around redirecting than it was what we see more often today. Uh, even though Federer hits the ball big, it, it was still, when it came to how Federer finishes, it was still taking the ball early and and making those really excellent redirections oftentimes. Let's see, ATP rankings 2003. Let's see what comes up. Uh, Juan Carlos Ferrero, that's another guy. Like, Kind of more about taking the ball earlier and changing direction more often, more than weight of shot. Yeah, Vagasi, Correa, Moya. Oh, Nalbandian. Oh, great example. Nalbandian was all about, I mean, that's about redirecting. So yeah, the game has changed. The game has changed. We see less redirections, but we see bigger bigger balls, heavier, heavier shots. Very interesting comment. Antonia, hi, Gil. Would be interested to hear your take on the Rybakina coach controversy. Do you think people are right to point out behaviors that seem problematic to them? Or is it just jumping to conclusions with little to no evidence based off of several gestures during high-intensity matches? Thanks. So basically, uh, Rybakina's coach, Stefano uh, Vukov, or Volkov. No, Vukov or Volkov? Hmm, sorry about that. Uh, one or the other. <laughs> uh, he have, I think it's Vukov. Look, he can get negative with Elena. So he can get be hard on her and kind of be like, what are you doing? Like, yeah, he gets negative with her. And that makes some people uncomfortable. This is a tough comment. I'm not... Here's my best answer for you. I think scrutiny is good. Uh, I just think it's, it's, let's just say it. Look, Pam Shriver was the biggest initiator of this conversation. And what Pam has in her heart is 100% good intentions and very, very necessary scrutiny on player-coach relationships on the WTA Tour which have unfortunately far too often been toxic, exploitative, and boundary crossing. And all Pam is doing is putting that under scrutiny, putting our antennas up to that kind of thing. And if, if, if there's a false alarm, to me that's a lot better than nobody paying any attention and turning a blind eye to it. So, you know, Rybakina came out and defended her coach and said, look, he he's great. This is just his his coaching style. I'm okay with it. It seems like, you know, she probably likes being coached hard. And by the way, in a lot of other sports, this is much more common. In tennis, hard coaching, a little bit less common because the coach can get fired by the player. But usually the power dynamic is a little bit different. And hey, like everything that... Stefano is doing in Rybakina's box, you realize like every single basketball coach, that's exaggeration. Like 50% of basketball coaches, 75% of football coaches, they're doing the same thing. They're saying, you idiot, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. You have to be better. I, you know, you're, you're a bum. I mean, all of the kind of negative, all of the negativity that we're so like shocked to see publicly from from Stefano in Reebok in his box. This is kind of normal in other sports. And uh, it's there's just a line. There's a fine line between bullying, uh, being there for somebody emotionally, which is very important, but also pushing their buttons in a way that's going to help them perform best as possible. So most great coaches will say, I know how to coach different athletes based on what makes them tick. With some players, I'm more positive. With some players, I beat them up. I beat them up. And what happens when I beat them up? They respond. They perform. And that might be Rybakina. So that's my stance on it. Basically, the scrutiny is really good, really necessary. Uh, and if if Rybakina has to say, hey, man, I, I appreciate your concern, but everything's all right. No harm. No harm in that. Uh, I think that's a lot better than the alternative which is uh, just not paying any attention to player-coach relationships on the WTA Tour 
and uh, those relationships being healthy. Because I have heard from a lot of insiders on tour that far too often it's unhealthy. I think that is all I want to cover. Anything else that I need to get to? Uh, look, as always, a lot of good comments that I didn't have time for. Uh, but I do need to wrap things up. It is very late. I have a flight tomorrow morning. Um, hope you enjoyed, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time.